on this episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Passion is everything when it comes to uh, figuring out. I, I have a saying, uh, when your gifts are met with passion, you are unstoppable. And that is something I think that all of us can take into life is um, how to be unstoppable people and how to be unstoppable humans. And it really starts with figuring out what you're good at, what you love to do, and intersecting it with passion. Stay tuned following the interview for On the Couch and Off the Rocker, our special guest's psychosilly analysis by Art Lab's own head cabager, Dr. Ima Freudnot. Welcome to Therapy Bites Art Lab, where Dr. Heath and his special guests share real-life stories of helping and healing. Fresh from the actual therapy couch, while taking a bite out of common counseling missteps and misconceptions. And now, here's Heath and the T-Ball team. Hey, T-Ball or parental units. Here is a problem that we can help you solve today. Has that kindergartner grown up overnight and headed for freshman year and a four-year ride on the college crazy coaster? Are you biting your nails wondering if even after the 100 grand you're looking to pay in tuition, they're just going to wind up homeless or living in your basement anyway? Our guest today says she never knew what she wanted to be when she grew up. She was a typical good kid other than typical teenage rebellion. She never really got into trouble. She had good grades in school. She stayed away from drugs. She went to college after uh, graduating and not from the desire to be anything in particular, but because she just wanted to get out of the house and exert that ooh shiny, shiny, newfound independence. And didn't we all? Then came freshman year and freedom. Sounds like Braveheart. Uh, suddenly, she could do what she wanted when she wanted without answering to any joy killer parents. And this often meant partying on Thursday nights and missing Friday classes. Life was good or so she thought, but then came a letter after her first semester congratulating her on a whopping 1.8 GPA and welcoming her to the world of academic probation. And some of you know what, you're, what, know what I'm talking about. News alert, she was about to lose her chance at higher education and a better life, and she says she didn't even know that was possible. Join us in the art lab today for our own all grown up Kim Possible's freshman year experience on an episode we call Frat Party Psychology of Surviving Freshman Year. Stay in the stands at the end of the interview, T ballers, and witness our special guest slug a bite sized brain ball with your name all over it clean out of the art lab. Well, Kim, uh, fill us in on the rest of your freshman year. I, I kind of left off part of the story. What happened next? Well, well, first of all, it's great to be here. Thank you. And, uh, you know, so the, the story was I went back to school and I thought to myself, I better figure this out pretty darn quick because you literally have one semester to get that GPA up before they give you the boot. Uh, and I did figure it out. So um, flash forward to I, I graduated. And, um, you know, the, the truth is I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, even with, you know, degree in hand and st student loan debt. And I embarked into the world and I always worked, you know, I was a responsible person. I always worked. I always made money, but I wasn't passionate about anything that I was doing. And I joke that I had my first midlife crisis when I turned 40. And that's when I started doing all this personal growth work. And I, I was trying to figure out who I am. You know, what do I stand for? What could give me a little more passion in my life? And I stumbled upon coach training as a career. And I kid you not, the moment I walked into coach training, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be when I grow up. I knew I was a coach. So to bring it all full circle, for me, in that experience, I realized and I became very connected to what my gifts are and what I knew I was good at. And when I thought about it, I had all of these gifts when I was a teenager. I was the person my friends came to for advice. I was always positive. I was a cheerleader. I was, you know, I could turn lemons into lemonade. I was just this positive person who had soft skills. I didn't have any real tangible gifts that, like I wasn't artistic. I wasn't musically inclined. I wasn't uh, a super, you know, uh, intellectual, quite frankly. Like I wasn't a bookworm. But my gifts really revolved around helping people. And I just really connected with the idea of helping young people get in touch with that thing 
before they wasted 20 years of their lives. Like I, I did it the long way. I want to help people connect with that at a sooner, uh, you know, so, so this was a long journey for me and I'm hoping that younger people can connect a little earlier and, and launch and do what they love. What is it that you think is lacking um, in, in, in raising kids today that that they don't just walk in more prepared to uh, the freshman year what 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 do, how do parents need to up their game what what are we missing out on here i mean that's a great question and and you know from where i'm sitting i think that life is so different now for young people everything is about making the grade there's so much pressure on them to perform and i think that we've created this young culture of of kids who are just working hard to make the sports team, get the A, perform, get into college, and they're just so stacked up with tasks and to-dos that they have completely lost sight of who they are and what they really want. Uh, and for parents, I, because of this, because of the competitiveness of even just getting into college, a lot of parents, you know, you've heard the tiger tiger mom and all of these things, I think that so many of our parents are doing too much for our young people, quite frankly. Our kids don't have grit anymore. Uh, they don't have the capability of figuring things out for themselves necessarily and, um, and making better choices and moving forward because mom and dad have kind of paved that way for them. And uh, when they're left to their own devices in freshman year, uh, things can go quite wrong. Well, you know, the, the quote that comes to mind that I'm sure a lot of our listeners have heard, it's, it's got to be one of my all-time favorite quotes, and I think I probably first heard my dad say it when I was a kid, that you can uh, teach a per you can, you can uh, feed a person a fish and feed them for a day, give them a fish, feed them for a day, or you can teach them how to fish and feed yeah. them for a lifetime. And I, I think that parents um, – don't spend enough time teaching kids how to think on their own. It's just quicker mm -hmm. if you do all the thinking for your kids. It's just so much quicker. And and I have a nursing home example to emphasize how that works. When I was consulting in long-term care, you know, the way far other end of, of the age spectrum, which I truly, truly miss, if, if you want to – just soak up wisdom, be mm -hmm. a regular visitor with a really old person in a nursing home or anywhere because that is just such a wasted fountain of wisdom. But that's a whole other episode too. But one thing I noticed in, in nursing homes is that you would have Mrs. Jones or Mr. Johnson, whoever, and they would walk in the front door but then give it a month or two and they could no longer walk. Now, why the quick decline? The quick decline is it's that the old people walk slow and um, it's just quicker to plop them in a wheelchair and shove them down a hallway. But when you do that, they lose the ability to walk. Now, apply that to kids. Uh, it's quicker to do all, all the thinking for your kids but if you do that, the question is, what are they going to do when you're not around? You know, and, and we'll get this a little bit later. How, how are they equipped to think about what to do with bad influences? Now, I think as a kid, uh, I had an unfair advantage early on in college because, as some of you have heard me say on prior podcasts, I was just a really nerdy, backward, weird kid that had no friends and wasn't interested in having friends. Well, I did have friends. They were called books. Uh, my books were my friends. And I would uh, grow uh, mold under my bed in Petri dishes and look at it in a microscope. And I would uh, harvest uh, samples of pond water and grow paramecium and their little critters. If, if you've seen a weird tie, a lot of ties have things which are basically paramecium on them those little weird squiggly things, and I would look at those. And so when I went to college and the other kids said, hey, come join a fraternity, well, why would I want to do that? Come out drinking with us. Well, why Why would I want to do that? Uh, I, I, I don't particularly like uh, things that cause me to think less well, and and it, it wasn't a religious thing. It, was, it wasn't a 
I was taught not to do this. I, I, I just, I don't like uh, seeming like my brain is out of control. And also, I'm not a crowd follower. So if, if everybody's doing it, that's the last thing I want to do if everybody's doing it. But it's been my experience with young people in therapy that that they, they're they very susceptible to that. What, what's been your experience with those things? Oh, 100%. You know, people, there's really only two things in life that people need and this is included for young people in my humble opinion if your if your basic needs are being met right food shelter clothing we all need connection we need people in our lives and for you apparently it was books and paramecians or whatever that was <laughs> but i you know we need people we need some relationships whether it's one friend or family um, intimate relationships we need something in our lives and then we need a reason to get up in the morning right and and that's a you know, that's kind of for, for 18 to 22 year olds, they don't necessarily think like that. But if we don't have a reason, what is our why? What are we, what is our purpose? What are we doing here in this world? And um, that's where things go all wrong. And I think I just went in this complete spin out. What was your original question? I'm so sorry. Well, um, no, I, I think that's right on point because um, I, it, I actually went and lived on campus for a while because that's just what you do. That was just my understanding. Mm -hmm. I was within, oh, I don't know, less than 30 minutes of, of the college. Uh, by the way, my college, uh, not not a plug. I don't have an affiliate agreement with these guys, but it was uh, Lyon College. It wasn't called that mm -hmm. back then, but it's called Lyon College now, L-Y-O-N. And it was known as the Harvard of the South. And it was really hard to get in, which really begs the question, how did I ever get in? Uh, because even though I was an early kid, I, I didn't have a high GPA, uh, not because I couldn't do it, but because I didn't find value in it. Uh, if, if you ask me, yeah. well, hey, you know, you need to get that GPA up. My response would be, well, why would I do that? If I can invest X amount of time and graduate, if graduation is the goal, yeah. And all I got to do to graduate is keep a 2.0, um, yeah. then why would I work harder? And my goal to graduate high school was to just have a 2.0. And, and I viewed anything beyond a 2.0 was uh, wasted effort because yeah. the point one and the point five and, and the other 2.0, if I were going to get a 4.0, would represent a whole bunch of time that I could, that I would never get back. And I could, you know, spend, I guess, on my science projects. And, and that's, that's what I did. And I was, I was so disappointed, Kim, when I graduated high school with a 2.7 because I thought, crap, that's 0.7 of time. I'll never get back that I could have invested otherwise, you know, why, what a waste of freaking time. And then I got into college and I had some people that showed me the value of, of, of a higher mm -hmm. GPA. Uh, but the biggest thing for me that got me out of bed and going to classes, which is really kind of weird, I guess, is I just like learning new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, drinking didn't help me learn new stuff, so I didn't drink. Uh, joining a fraternity didn't help me learn new stuff, so I didn't join a fraternity. Going to college parties, what what would I learn there? It's a bunch of people listening to loud music, jumping up and down. I, what, what is there to learn from that? You know, uh, um, and so I think that, that kids misplace what they find value in. And, and, and yes, I, I realize I maybe shouldn't call them kids. They are young adults, but right. young adults, as my son is a young adult, but he does great, a great job at this is they misplace what they decide to find value in and they find value in the wrong things. Yeah, it, it's, you know, and, and it's so true. And, you know, and, and to take it the other way, you know, a student can be a great student and have a 4.0 GPA and not have a great college experience. Uh, so it's not just about grades. You know, a lot of times, and I think that's something that parents think, go to school, my kid is a good student, has a great GPA, they're going to be great in college. And that's not always the case because you're missing the whole social side of thing. Now, it sounds like your experience, you didn't need that social, you didn't need friends necessarily, you took value in other things, but those students tend to be isolated. And I do work with a lot of students who maybe have one friend, are introverted, 
don't care about those things. A lot of kids don't party now. It's not necessarily about drinking. Has that, has that changed? Uh, because it, it, it seemed like when I was in college, it would just party, party oh, all semester. Where do you think my 1.8 GPA came from? <laughs> I, I had the party scene down. Trust me, I, I was at a party every Thursday night. Um, no, it has. I wouldn't say it's changed. I would say that the the societal norms maybe have changed a little bit. I think I think young people today are if they don't drink, it's OK to not drink. It's OK to not do these things. And I think maybe when we were younger, it was a little more of a push to fit in to do some of that stuff. That is not to say kids still don't drink and to excess. And a lot of them are in the danger zone. Uh, but I do think that some students are, are more comfortable saying, you know what? No, I, I don't drink. And that's OK. And uh, you can go to a party and not drink. When I was a kid, you couldn't go to a party and not have a red solo cup in your hand. You looked like an idiot, you know, so <laughs> it's um, I think that has changed a little bit. But even the straight laced good kids still struggle. They struggle with connecting with other people. They struggle with dating and relationships. They struggle with intimacy. They struggle with how are they going to connect when they graduate and get a job? And how are you going to connect with the, the guy in the cube next to you if you don't know how to interact and be social with other people? That's the truth. I mean, the social part of school is just as important as the yeah, academic. Yeah. Well, yeah, humans, we are, we are social creatures. And um, uh, yes, I mean, my, my, uh, uh, my motivation was based in, as, as everybody's is, what you decide to find value in. And yeah, there's, 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 it's okay either way. If you have one friend, then pour your, the time you have into that one friend. If you have four or five, that's great too. Um, uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, a famous motivational uh, speaker and writer mm -hmm. would say that uh, nobody really has more than a handful of friends. There's no such thing as, as having 50, 60, 70. I mean, goodness gracious, how would you have time for all that? And uh, that's a Facebook marketing thing. Those aren't friends. Those are just people that you know mm -hmm. online. But uh, what do you think is the main thing? Because coaching is, is huge. You know, there's coaches everywhere. But what, what do you think you bring to the table different in this particular area uh, than others. In other words, what's your uniqueness in the college prep business of coaching? Yeah, I. so I am not at all, like most people in the college, the, uh, there's a lot of people that help kids get in. What I do is I'm really good at connecting with a young person and meeting them where they are. Uh, I think it's important to figure out who they are and help them become the best version of themselves. And a lot of times, they don't know what that is. So I just ask really great, great questions and help them get connected to that thing. But what I'm noticing with a lot of people is that a lot of young uh, students, they kind of think they know what they want to do with their lives, but they're either afraid of pursuing it because they don't think they're good enough, or they are becoming something because mom and dad said this is a great way to make money and they're not making the right choice and they're not in their lane because like I said earlier, the easiest way to be successful in life is to connect your gifts with passion. If you can take what comes easily to you, you know, what you're just good at and find something that you're interested in, that's the thing you should be doing. So that's what I try to do. That's the first step is connecting somebody with, hey, what are you good at? You know, and then what do you love to do? Let's explore some areas there because Dr. Laurie, an engineer, is only going to work if that's really what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. And and what tip would you have for parents about that? Because I, I would guess, well, I don't even guess. I know I talk to parents all day long uh, in, in my, my real job, which is, is actually not podcasting. We do this kind of as a, as a, as a public service, but uh, to just get the information out there. But I find that parents really struggle with what you just said that you do, and that is to ask better questions. What kind of tips might you have for parents to maybe engage in such a conversation with their soon-to-be freshman students and even current freshman, sophomore students? Yeah, that, you know, I'm going to go, I, I love how you worded that question. Here's what I would say. Ask them questions, don't tell them. I think a lot of parents and kids have this, I, I, I call it this built in, like they have these shields around their ears when their parent starts talking, you know, remember the peanuts when it's like, wah, 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 wah. They literally, <laughs> when their parent starts talking, especially if it's giving them advice or 
saying something, they put these shields up and it's like, I can't hear a word you're saying. They're almost internally, I, I, I don't know if I'm communicating that correctly. So ask them questions, don't tell them. A lot of parents will say this, oh son, you're so good at this, why don't you do this? Instead of doing that, say, hey, you know, I noticed that you really excel in sports. Is there anything in the realm of sports that maybe you are interested in pursuing? And let them tell you. They have their answers. Parents want a shortcut, like we talked earlier. They want to get to the thing. And 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 here's the truth. Parents just, they love their kids, right? That's all it is. This is all about love. They love their children. They want them to be successful. If you ask any parent in the world, what do I want for my kid? And they'll say happiness. I just want my kid to be happy, to launch, to make money and to, you know, be able to live on their own, but do something that they enjoy. So even if the parent's dream is doctor, lawyer, engineer, I think they're fine if their person, if their kid comes out and says, mom and dad, I want to be, I want to run a restaurant. I want to do whatever it is, as long as they're happy and they're making money and they're self-sufficient. I think that's all that really matters to a parent ultimately. So, well, and, and I, uh, I think that there, and, and I make this mistake, but I think that there's often a rush to the end in a conversation uh, instead of viewing the conversation as a journey that has value, uh, the end point, the conclusion, the decision that, that has value too, but parents listening, the, the thing that has equal, if not greater value is just the journey of the conversation. It's uh, the journey mm-hmm. of the conversation, which can cultivate your relationship with anybody to a deeper level. A lot of, a lot of folks really catastrophize. That's a, uh, art lab term, uh, also a CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy term, uh, catastrophize the messiness of conversation. But I want to say to you guys, you T-ballers out there, therapy about art labbers, that conversation is constructed to be messy on purpose. Think about that for a moment. It's mm-hmm. meant to be messy on purpose so that we have to dig for stuff. And like Kim said, that we have to ask the you know better questions and different questions and it's uh really like going to a place not too far from where i live it's it's actually a a a diamond mine and you can pay x amount of dollars and you can get your little scoop and you can go out there and you can dig into the dirt and maybe uncover a diamond and people do that regularly. If you ever come to the state of Arkansas, go to the Murfreesboro Diamond Mine, and you might be able to find a big, uh, big old eight carat diamond or something. People are still finding them, by the way. It'd be a great summer vacation before the freshman year uh, your kid goes to school. But my point is, it's dirty and it's tedious and it's a lot of work and it's messy. And when you're communicating with your young person, uh, look look for the diamonds. But you don't do that by telling. Watch now. You can't see this, so I'm going to try to do the sound effect. That was an in breath. <laughs> I, I want you parents to notice that you cannot speak when you're breathing in, and that's on purpose too. So the best thing to do when you're listening to your kids is take deep breaths in. It oxygenates the brain. But then, as one of our earlier guests, Alan Carroll, uh, who, who does some great work in, in the uh, meditation arena, says uh, that in-breath creates a silence where communication can occur. And if you're not breathing in enough, you're not having communication. You're just being a fire hydrant of information. And so take take some big uh, some big impress, guys. Um, what what are some share with us some testimonials of of if you can uh, some real life stories of people benefiting from what you're teaching out there, Kim, to just to let parents know what's actually possible. Yeah, I you know recently I did a consultation with a young man who was ready to drop out of school. He just um, he his GPA is mediocre at best. Uh, he's uh, pre business and he's just not really connected to that at all. And in one conversation, I asked him if you know if if failure wasn't an option, right? If you could just be anything you wanted to be, 
uh, what would you do? And he said, oh, I would I would be in sports analytics. Like it came to him in oh, wow. 2.5 seconds. He, he he just said that, <laughs> and he's and in and, and then we started talking about sports a little bit. This kid is one hundred percent all about sports, and I said, there are a million jobs in the world where you could be plugged into sports in some way. Mm -hmm. Why are you a business major, right? And he goes, well, there isn't a sports program at my school, and I said, well, what kind of clubs and activities are there at your school? The next week we met, he came back and he said, okay, I did some research on some clubs. There's a club called Sports Analytics. <gasps> no way. <laughs> There's a club. I've never even heard have, of that. Right. They have, it's the guy, like he's a big baseball guy. Did you ever see Moneyball? Yes. Yes. Great, okay. You know, so, you know, in Moneyball, they talk about how stats, you know, it's the statistician guy uh -huh. who, you know, so he's really into stats. And they have a club where they bring in sports analytics professionals and they talk about their experiences with sports analytics. And then there's another club where it's just a group of kids that get together that are sports enthusiasts and they just talk about every sport and what's going on. And I, I just looked at him and I said, do you think these are two clubs maybe you should be involved in? <laughs> and, and, you know, so instantly, he doesn't want to drop out of school. He has life. Now, I'm not saying we fixed everything in two sessions, uh -huh. but he knows where point B might be, right? Yeah. He's standing in point A doing stuff he doesn't want to do, but he knows what point B could look like for him. And now it's easier to take the steps to get there because, and it might mean transferring to a school that can support what he wants to do a little differently. Like there's, there's options, but at least there's somewhere to go now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, you know, that's that's one example. Well, I think that's fantastic. That's right along the line of what we teach in the art lab. And that is uh, find find something that you can find meaning in and then pour your life into it. I, I tell uh, young people, you can uh, do anything. Uh, if you want to be an astronaut, you can do that. If you want to be a sports analyst or a chef, you can do that. But my wife and I were eating out at, at a restaurant that's so expensive. We probably won't do that very often, but we're eating at this expensive restaurant. And the couple next to us was telling us about one of their kids who is, is in food service and became a chef uh, for, I think, uh, the Dallas Cowboys. And wow. I thought, wow, a chef for the Dallas Cowboys. Now I wasn't good enough, and they left being a chef for that team and went to be a chef for another team. And I thought, gosh, who would have imagined that you actually get paid to cook food for famous sports people? Right. And it's yeah. evidently pretty pretty lucrative. But, but, lucrative. but you can do anything, guys. Uh, but the best thing to be, well, the best thing to be is yourself. Right. Do anything, yeah. but just be you, because there's a special space carved out just for you, and your job is to completely fill that space. Uh, as I spoke of earlier, I was a nerdy kid. I grew up, my, my friends are books. I didn't have a lot of people friends. Uh, my friends are the paramecium that I looked at under the microscope. I make no apologies for that. That's the space I'm meant to fill, and I, I feel it fully. I, well, why, why do I need to apologize to anybody for things that I find interest and meaning in? And you guys don't have to apologize to anybody either. Stop trying to live up to the expectations of a peer group and find what you find meaning in. And if they find it funny or hilarious what you're doing, well, take a tip from Doc Keith. I love that. One of my favorite things in the world, uh, and I think this is a special skill we could all develop, one of my favorite things in the world is to be laughed at. Because, see, when you laugh at me, you're paying attention to me. If You, you know, I was, I was uh, uh, introverted, but I was still kind of a clown around the dinner table and did all kinds of things and, and was kind of a jokester and an uh, a amateur magician. I thought I might want to grow up and be a magician one day. And then I thought when I got to college, I would be a systems analyst for computer systems. Of course, one time I thought I'd be a scientist, and I am a scientist. It's just a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. And I like fiddle faddle with neurons in people's brains. But you can do anything you want to do, but be the person you are because no one can ever be better at being you than you. For full show notes and transcript of today's episode, go to therapybites.podbean.com.
Welcome to Social Media Smackdown. Tonight, the irresistible force meets the illogical object. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to reason! Here's an Instagram post from Yellow Journalism Disinformation Platform, Sack to Bay. It's well-meaning until you discover that the meaning is to sell you something, and worse yet, they use clickbait slides that perpetuate distorted thinking to do so. Here's one of the kooky Kool-Aid drinking pseudo-psychological slides among the many of their mumbo-jumbo posts where they purport to teach about healthy relationships but sabotage people instead. The post says, is it time to cut off a friendship? Number one. How do they react when you share exciting news with them? As if how a person reacts when you share exciting news is telling you when you should cut off a relationship too. Do they ask about you or are they absorbed in themselves? As if if someone is interested in themselves, they can't also be interested in you. Number three, do you, here's the F word alert, do you feel like your most authentic self around them? As if how you feel can tell you whether you're your authentic self or whether a feeling can tell you whether you should end a relationship or not. Well, there you go, folks. If you want great advice on how to ruin relationships and die lonely, just follow the advice of the above kooky Kool-Aid drinking pseudo psychological social media mumbo jumbo post sadly pushed out by a supposed mental health account but hey what do i know i'm only in the mental health field for the last 38 years got a dual phd in neuropsychology and forensic psychology and treat patients every day who sabotage themselves and their relationships with such disabling distortions t ballers friendship is not about what you get but what you give. If you're unwilling to do this and want to dictate how friends respond to you, maybe it's you who are self-absorbed and self-obsessed and need to check your own health as a friend. T-Ballers in training give psychologically poisonous posts like this the old one-two punch. What a slobber knocker. The winner by Psychological Smackdown, Doug Heath. No pronouns were harmed during the production of this podcast. You're listening to Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bite-sized therapy for your brain with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball team. The best advice on the net. No copay required. Welcome to the Therapy Bites Art Lab Library, where we have poured over thousands of volumes to bring you the latest Couch Crumbs quilt. Oh, would you like a napkin? You're getting crumbs in the book. That okay, me eat book. Oh. And now today's Couch Crumbs quote. Sylock Holmes here with another Couch Crumb quote from Doc Heath. Metacognition, thinking outside the casket, the skill of making sure your brain doesn't become a coffin where your thoughts go to die. Oh, you got crumbs on the couch. Extra points for you. Live the art life. Become a T-Ball teammate inner circle supporter on Patreon at patreon.com slash therapy bites. Here's Heath and the T-Ball team. You might look at your peer group and pick somebody out and say, well, I'd like to be them. Well, think about that. If there's already one of them, then a second one of them would be just redundant, making one of you unnecessary. Since there's (laughs) only one of you... Uh, I think of Mr. Rogers here. Uh, You can go look up that quote, guys. But uh, there has never been anyone like you in the history of the universe. There's no one like you now. And in the future of the universe, there will never again be anyone like you. So what a tragedy it would be to stop being you and just copy 
Yeah, I don't yeah. know. No offense to Britney Spears. Uh, 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 maybe she was yesterday, but who is it now? I don't know who's the famous person now. But to be anybody would be a waste because that robs the world of of you. So, you know, just uh, yeah, if, can just I take you. that one step further? Because mm -hmm. that's actually one of my core philosophies um, in, in my book. I talk about happiness and success. And the number one step is to always do you, I call it, which is really and always be you. And in addition to everything you just said, you're not going to attract the right people into your life. And if you are not authentically you and just going out in the world and 100 percent being who you are, uh, you're not going to attract the right people into your life. You're not going to attract the, it's really uncomfortable to try and be something that you're not super uncomfortable. So that's really the, the caveat is like, let's get, let's get, uh, let's be you fry your fly, your freak flag or do whatever you do, but you're going to attract the people and the relationships and the opportunities in your life because you're authentically being yourself. And I just popped up on the screen, if you're watching this later on YouTube, our little guy called IUTY, I-U-T-Y. Uh, there's a U, U in a IUTY, and that stands for inaccurate, unrealistic thoughts. And mm -hmm. thinking that you should be anyone other than you is a inaccurate, unrealistic thought. And we teach about this guy, which is now over Kim's face. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. But that guy is Artie. RD stands for accurate realistic thoughts, accurate realistic mm -hmm. thoughts. The most accurate realistic thought you can have about you is to just be you. And another one I'll put up here real quick since this is right in front of me is uh, uh, a gnat. And this gnat <laughs> spelled N-A-T, not we dropped the G on it. N-A-T stands for negative automatic thought. And this is the fairy tailing gnat. It is a fairy tale to think that, oh, if I was just like this person, that person, the other person, my life would be perfect. And, you know, I get that in, in with my uh, with my own clients and they will say, oh, my goodness, if 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 my life was just like so and so. Well, when people see me, it's confidential, so I can't say anything, but I'm sitting there thinking inside of my head. Uh, hang on for this one, guys. I'm thinking inside of my head, gosh, the person you're wanting to be was here yesterday, and their <laughs> life really sucks. <laughs> you just don't know about it. So you're, they're really wanting to be somebody whose life is really falling apart, and they just don't know. And that's called that's called fairy tailing. A uh, another one I'll put up just really really quick. Uh, because, and this is over my face now, but this is another gnat, and this is called the mind reading gnat. When you mm. start to think that you know what someone's thinking about you, that's called mind reading. Now, listen, if you guys can do that, uh, I want you to reach out to me because you and I are going to get in my 2004 F-250 four-wheel drive truck and drive to Tunica, which is where the casinos are. <laughs> and since you can read minds, you're going to help me make $10 million because you can read the minds of the dealers. But guess what? I don't think you can read minds at all. Therefore, you should remind yourself that you don't know what someone's thinking of you. What's the best way to figure out what someone's thinking of you? Well, you could ask them and then they mm -hmm. could tell you. But guess what? Often uh, when people tell you they're thinking nasty things about you, they're not thinking nasty things about you at all. That's all them. That's all a completely different issue and situation inside of their mind, their own cognitive yep. distortion, distorted way of thinking in the art lab, as we call it. Uh, Kim, on, on your webpage, you mentioned a game plan for academic and social success. What, what kind of just briefly, what does that consist of? Well, you know, my, the game for me, I believe that coaching, you know, I'm a coach. I believe in coaching. When I work with students, I have a semester long program. And oftentimes I tell parents, you know, this is my, I, I'm kind of an insurance policy for your tuition money. Uh, if you're going to spend $50,000 a year to send your kid to school, let's make sure they get the most out of that experience, right? So uh, students work with me. We work for an entire semester. We meet once a week for 30 minutes via Zoom, and we set goals. And the game plan is really, 
What do you want? What's point B? And my job is to get them there. And it's an it's a relationship. You know, in in, in therapy, you have a relationship with your you know your your patients and your clients, and it's the same thing here. Um, there's you know there's balance. There's learning how to navigate everything, learning how to ask for help and find resources on campus, uh, because that's the biggest thing is that students wait too long to get help. So uh, they wait until literally there. I usually get phone calls when a kid is about to flunk out or is in the depths of despair. And really, ideally, it would be great if they got in front of these things and learned really great habits, time management, how to balance everything, how to ask for help what to do to move forward, how to get an internship. So those are the kind of things that I, I help students with so that they can get in front well, of these things. What about healthy boundaries? Yeah, a hundred percent. The boundaries are huge. You know, it's kind of like when a student first gets on campus, it's all about getting comfortable. Like you want them to get comfortable with their surroundings. And then as soon as they're comfortable, you want to st stretch a little bit and get a little uncomfortable so that you're engaging. But then outside of that is the danger zone. That's when too many frat parties on a Thursday night. That's what, you know, if, if drinking becomes a problem or uh, the person that lets their friends take over all of their time or, you know, one of the biggest ones is um, relationships. You know, if you've got a boyfriend or girlfriend and you're spending every night with that person just doing the things that that person wants to do. You need you need your own space and your own time. And um, there's definitely boundaries in a lot of things, friendships, relationships, all of that. Yeah, and, and on that point, uh, I hope this kind of fits in there because it, it, it dawns on me that a lot of people will say, I want to graduate from college. I want to position myself through my education to get a job at, I don't know, the XYZ marketing company or whatever. Mm -hmm. But but I challenge that often. I'll say, but you don't. And they'll say, well, but I do. And I say, no, you don't. And of course, they'll say, but I do. And we're playing, you know, ping mm -hmm. pong with this idea. And, and my point is, well, then if these are the stepping stones to getting what you're telling me you want, if these are the stepping stones, and we agree that they are, you've got a, a, a test, you've got a final that requires study, that requires devotion. If that's really the stepping stone, if you really wanted to get where you're saying you're wanting to get, then you would be putting your feet on those stepping stones, but you're not. Right. You're going to frat parties. So let's just get real. Right. I think that you don't want to graduate. <laughs> I think that you don't want that job. Uh, they'll come here, and I've got a, a nice place, so I won't live where you live. Well, but you don't. Well, what do you mean I don't? Yeah. Well, because if you did, you would put your time where your mouth is. And instead of saying, I want to live here, because, see, living here is hard. Living here means skipping frat parties, mm -hmm. maybe not even being a part of a sorority fraternity, uh, mm -hmm. skipping the keg party. Uh, right. See, if you really are sincere with what you say you want, then you will put your feet on the stepping stones to get you there. And I'm I'm big free will guy. Look, you can do anything. As I said earlier, you can do anything you want to do. I'm just saying be genuine with yourself. If your goal is to graduate, then you can't do these things. Because if you do these things, you won't. You're putting graduation at risk. So you don't have to be genuine with me, but at least be genuine with with your with yourself um i had another question here let's see where did that go uh how about helping kids with sound decisions versus risky decisions maybe uh, yep. a word on that totally um i'm going to give you an example of uh something that happened a while ago this was years ago i had one of my female clients i was talking to her and she was at a frat party uh she liked this guy and they hooked up, you know, we're in a hookup culture. They hooked up. She went downstairs to get a drink. And then she saw that same guy ushering another girl into his room. And she was devastated. So it's two o'clock in the morning. And the decision she made in that moment was to walk across campus by herself, intoxicated, oh. uh, to get home, right? And you know, it turned out okay. She shared this with me. But the truth is, you know, that could have been a really bad choice. You know, oh. you hear about, 
you hear about sexual assault and things on campus like that all the time. And it's like when, as soon as you mix alcohol with bad decisions and you put yourself at risk and you know, that's, that's when bad things can happen. So I talk to students all the time about, you know, especially women, it's like always travel in groups. Don't uh -huh. walk alone, you know, make sure if you're drinking, make sure there's someone sober in your group. You have to have a sober buddy. That is the per the voice of reason, whether you're driving or walking, you need someone who can make a decision and a sound one and, and get you out of the party. Um, but yes, we talk about those things all the time. Um, even when it comes to academics, a student who isn't taking personal responsibility for their grades, uh, and most students don't, you know, I've never had a student tell me, uh, I got a C on that test because I wasn't prepared. It's usually that teacher doesn't like me, everybody failed, you know, when you ask them, when you delve in. So, so really it's, all right, let's take personal responsibility and let's get in front of the what can go wrongs before they go wrong. Uh -huh. um, so that you're armed with the right choices. Where do you go for help? You know, if something is happening, if you need a ride, you know, what phone numbers do you have at your disposal? If you are drunk at a party and all your friends left you, what are you going to do? And we yeah. talk about some of those things in advance. Well, and, and I want to go back to the walking across the, uh, the campus and, and, and the, you know, especially while you've been drinking. And I put Artie up there again, right, right over Kim's left shoulder. And Artie's based in a brain cell. He, he's basically a, a neuron with a baseball cap on. And uh, accurate, realistic thoughts. And, and here's an accurate, realistic thought about, um, well, uh, rape. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've talked with my wife for years about this, and, and I'm, I'm a big safety guy. And I, I, I safe, safety ties everything. And we will talk about her putting herself at risk uh, or not putting herself at risk by where she parks and the amount of light where she parks and parking in a place that's not deserted. And it, it's really kind of an amazing thing to me because, and some of you listening will identify with this, she'll say, oh, who would want to rape me? Mm. Well, guys, listen up. Rape is not about how gorgeous, pretty, good-looking you are. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with sex. It has a lot to do with uh, the impulse control of the person committing that, uh, uh, that, that crime, that, that terrible thing. Uh, it has to do with them thinking this makes them more powerful or more controlling. I, I've known of, of young men raping 80 and 90 year old women now see that has nothing to do with looks or anything and and, and yeah there's some gorgeous 80 90 year old women no offense to you ladies out there but it's not about that and my point is this is that use some accurate realistic thoughts arties accurate realistic thoughts to value and respect yourself enough to not put yourself at risk because believe me, I, I've done this therapy thing for 38 years. Once that proverbial bell is rung, it, it's really hard to unring it. Don't put yourself at risk. Uh, have enough respect for yourself uh, and your safety to just don't put yourself at risk. Don't do it. You, 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 that will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost mm -hmm. you more than you ever wanted to pay. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there are type one and type two decisions. Uh, this is in a book called The uh, Basil's Letters. And uh, Steve, I can't remember Steve's last name, but uh, uh, he talks about type one, type two decisions. Type two decisions are decisions that are quickly modified and you can make quick course corrections. But type one decisions stick with you. And putting yourself at risk is a type one decision that could follow you throughout your life. Uh, okay, well, enough of that deep, serious stuff. Let's move on to something else here. Um, what are some steps you found, Kim, that are, are keys to success on day one, day one of freshman year, regardless whether it's freshman year of college, freshman year of a new job, of a new city, of a new relationship? There's lots of freshman years and life experiences. What might sure. be a good tip for day one of freshman year at anything? Of anything, I would say to engage. 
I would say first, you know, step, no matter what that freshman year thing is, um, be present, engage, meet, you know, if it's freshman year of, of college or high school, meet people. I, I have my students talk to at least three people every day, but let's say you're on a date and it's, you know, you're, you're dating, um, show up and be present for that date, right? Um, listen, engage, uh, take an interest. If you're going to do anything and it's the first time you're doing it, don't sit back and be a wallflower, engage, uh, put yourself, get the most out of that, that first experience. Yeah, and, and I think part of that, even though we just talked about safety, is kind of going the other way in realizing that you can engage safely. You can mm -hmm. be around people safely. Other people's opinions are not a danger, not a threat to your mm -hmm. safety. It's just opinions like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. And um, how how would you uh, – how do we decide in our culture today uh, what to be when we grow up? What What's a, a, a tip for that? You know, it, it, for me, it obviously we have to be able to, um, well, if it's a job, right? If it's work and a career, we want to do something that makes us money. But for some people, it could be being a parent. It could be, you know, there's a lot of things. It's, it's going back to when you said, what do you put value in? You know, if, if all you've ever wanted to do is be a parent, there is no shame in being a parent and doing that really well. Uh, if it's a job, obviously you have to, you know, in today's society, we can't do things without money. We can't pay our bills without money. So finding a way that you can contribute to the world, uh, w doing something that you enjoy so that when you wake up in the morning, you're actually excited about what's the next 24 hours we're all about. You know, I, I agree with that. And, and that you just hit the nail on the head of why we at the art lab even do this podcast, because, um, we, we find value meaning in it. Uh, we want to give yeah. back. We want to leave the world a slightly better place, at least, uh, mm -hmm. than it was when we arrived on the planet. And um, I think find something that, that makes a difference in people's lives, folks. Um, there's all kinds of selfish things out there that we can do, but find something that, that makes a difference. Believe you me, there is an audience for your skill set. Uh, we live on a planet of 8 billion people, and on a planet of 8 billion people, if only one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent find value in your message, then, gosh, you've made a difference than the majority of people who've ever lived. Uh, find something that, that gives back. And, and you know, I, I also wanted to mention before we run out of time is it's kind of dawned on me. G give me your thoughts on this. It's kind of dawned on me that in our culture, unfortunately, there's really no rite of passage for when you're really an adult. Mm. There, there's no, there's some cultures that to be quote a man, uh, you climb to the top of a tower, tie bamboo to your ankles and jump off the tower. And it, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you don't die, you're, you're a man. Uh, don't sign me up for that. But, but d do you see people struggle with when am I really a woman? When am I really a man? When am I really an adult? You know, a little bit, I, the, the, yes, because I do coach some students who have graduated. I think if young people in their mid twenties haven't found success or aren't really clear about what their next steps are, they start to get stressed about that. Meeting the right person, you know, we put, you know, getting married, being in a relationship, people tie all of this to what it is to be an adult. But I think that some people grow up faster than others. Some people, mm. we have learning experiences that in, in the present moment, we feel like are setting us back, but really it's all for us, right? Everything is helping us become who we are now. So if you become an adult at 30 and someone else is an adult at 22, great. I, I think adulting is a, an interesting word and becoming an adult is an interesting <laughs> thing because you know, we have a chronologic, chronological age and then we have our life experience. I think yeah. we have some kind of moniker of what we would consider to be success in uh -huh. some way um, to be considered an adult, to live. For young people, I think it's finally living on your own and not uh, having to rely on your parents. That, that's, is, that's a good one. That That's a good one. I, uh, I you know, I've, I've been developing my hypothesis of that for gosh, probably decades since I first wondered when was I really an adult. Mm. And and I don't think it's 
owning a house. Uh, I don't think it's having a job. I don't think it's um, certainly having the most friends or just being able to do what you want to do. Um, I, 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 if I had, for me, I, I would say it happens, and I, I really hope some listeners ad- adopt this. I think it's when you think about your decisions, number one, and then you take responsibility for them. And I've made all kinds of decisions that were just big freaking screw ups, but I decided that Uh, Mm -hmm. I had a, uh, uh, and and I hope she's not listening. I don't mean the offense, but I, I, I learned a lot. But when I was at the VA, I had somebody who's just the most difficult of supervisors, but her words still come back to me. Uh, she, three words, three words. She, I was whining and complaining and she said, you chose this. (laughs) I thought, man, what a blah, 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 blah. You know, she is, uh, but she's right. She's (laughs) absolutely right. I, I, she's absolutely right. It, It really, sticks in my mind today uh teddy roosevelt i think it was teddy roosevelt uh uh he didn't coin the phrase but he used it uh, well maybe he did coin the phrase the buck stops here and uh the buck stops here he was talking about a buck knife because when they would play cards the the guy the person with the buck knife was the dealer the one that dealt the cards Mm. and uh the buck knife is in front of him the buck stops here Guys, when you and gals, when you get to the point where the buck stops here, I would say that's when you're an adult. And Kim's exactly right. Neurologically, the brain doesn't finish all its terminal corrections to the connections to the frontal cortex until late twenties, early thirties. Mm-hmm. Late twenties, early thirties. Until then, we are all literally playing with uh, less than a full deck. Uh, but <laughs> being that as it may, you can take responsibility earlier and make decisions. But once made, they're yours. I told my own son, I, I yeah. loved raising you. I love I, beyond anything. I was addicted to being my son's dad. My favorite thing in the whole world. I said, but now that you're over 18, which is in the U.S. legal adulthood, you can vote, sign contracts, uh, get married. Son, don't do that just yet. Um, <laughs> and all kinds of things. Uh, join the military. But uh, I'm no longer responsible for your decisions. Before that, I was. So make Mm -hmm. some good ones because the buck stops with you and realize that the choices you make, well, uh, you you chose them. Okay, let's do a quick speed round and wrap things up today. 30 seconds on each topic at the most, maybe 20 seconds. How to encourage and support choices that keep kids safe. What can a parent do? You know, the the preemptive thing, you know, do the what ifs. If you're in this situation, what might you do? I think that um, a pre-plan is the best plan. How to address the thought that parents have, you know, they're going to drink too much and just die. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) How to address that thought to a parent. Yeah. What what do we Uh, do with that? All wow, the catastrophizing a, about safety of our kids. Yeah, I, you know, it again, it's the pre, I think it's pre planning. It, it really is just um, have fun, have a good time, text me every morning so I know you're okay. If that makes them feel better, you know, um, when you're going out, just communication, communicate with your parents. And what to do with the thought that, hey, you know, they're going to get a degree in chicken grooming and they're going to wind <laughs> up homeless. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have lots of chickens in the state. We're the chicken capital. Could, could happen. Uh, I think that the um, it, it's if chicken grooming is something that floats their boat. <laughs> I think you got to let them go with chicken grooming. I think that uh, you know, let them do the thing that they love. And 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 back to what you said, take responsibility for where the chips may fall. We've talked about so many things today. We've talked about. I'll put a finer edge on some of this. The catastrophizing, just the mechanics of the freshman year. How to address uh, strategies to prepare your kids for bad influences. And there's lots of those out there. I, I told my own son. I said, look. We have raised you in a cocoon of safety. Uh, Mm -hmm. We have tried to protect you, but the people that you will be around in college, they were not raised like you. They have different values. And one of my favorite uh, ancient scriptures is be wise as serpents 
and gentle as doves. Why is the serpent mm-hmm. gentle as doves? Um, Kim, uh, what would you say would be your favorite secret, most outrageous freshman hurdle hack? T-ballers, time to quit your lollygagging. Get out of the dugout, onto the field, and live the art life. I, I mean, it's not outrageous, um, but the hurdle hack is to get involved on campus. One of the best things to do is find a club or activity that you want to be part of. I'm really big on socially plugging in in some way, even if it's a nerdy, introverted person. There are nerdy, introverted clubs where you can find your people. And uh, the best way to get comfortable is to do that. I guess you could take a tip from uh, one of my favorite Star Trek captains, Captain Jean-Luc Picard, who says, engage. That's right. Engage. Okay, for more from Kim Possible, as we come to call her, go to (laughs) KimGerard.com. That's K-I-M-G-I-R-A-R-D. We'll drop that in the show notes for you guys. And as far as an audience freebie or something that you guys should go check out, you can get the free excerpt from Kim's book, Rock Freshman Year. And all you got to do is invite her to your next cake party. No, I made that part up. That's not on there. (laughs) We journey now with Doc Eath. As he submerges with our special guest into the depths beneath the dark recesses of the therapy couch. And we're going to ask him a question that we have specially curated for her. And yes, I know I'm I'm all green here, but that's okay. Uh, It matches my shirt. All right, Kim, you're in bed asleep dreaming Mm -hmm. of your nightmare freshman any nightmare freshman from any part in history. And um, it could be anybody. It, it doesn't even have to be when uh, uh, related to college, but just, just a young person from any time in history who okay. we'll call a freshman. And uh, But this is the night. I know you wouldn't describe your clients this way, but this is a nightmare client. Man, they've got so much stuff going on, and it could be, again, from any time in history. Who is it? Uh, what would you say is their greatest hurdle and how would you help them? So the nightmare. Wow. That's a really great question for me. It's the really um, negative whiny person who does not take personal responsibility and blames the entire world for everything that has gone wrong in their life. Uh, and the one that's not coachable, you know, that's the one that that isn't willing to take a look and uh-huh. and move forward. Um, so it is sort of like that stair step thing that you talked about is is uh, is helping them see the reality of, hey, if you really want this, you have to do the things to get there, right? So helping them figure out what that is and getting them to a more positive place where they take personal responsibility. Fantastic. Make the buck stop in front of you once you make that decision, guys. And thank you all for joining us. Kim, it's been great fun. Thank you for joining us. Everybody, go back and uh, listen to the episode. Take some notes. Share it out with some people. Give us a a thumbs up and a follow. That really helps get the message out there. And uh, come back for the next episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. (laughs) Welcome to On the Couch and Off Our Rocker with Dr. Ima Freudnot where we review our special guest's Therapy Bites Art Lab episode, Psycho Malarkey Scale Assessment Results. That's PMS for short. Kim Gerard's PMS performance places her in the 97th percentile on the PMS's CFF, College Freedom Frenzy Scale. This indicates a dedicated high degree of academic preserving adventurousness in Kim Gerard's cortical crevices, with a terrifying tendency towards scholarly sachets. Overall, Kim Gerard's PMS psychosillymetric assessment results present a picture of an individual dreadfully inclined to push the boundaries of educational euphoria, but who tames these torrential implicit college-crazed impulses by embracing her own tales of lessons learned. 
this collegiate conquering soul likely has a promising prognosis of becoming a beacon for freshmen in the near future until these deviously despicable darker features of her psyche have been psychomologically analyzed and exercised. It is my considered conclusion that Kim Gerard be prescribed no less than a 96 milligram IS intrasororital dose of Successovir, or a 2300 milligram IA intraacademical dose of final examostatin to curtail educatitis related psychomosis. Dr. Ima Freudnot, Chief Shrinkstigator, Therapy Bites Art Lab. Grab some of this episode's guest merchandise, specially designed to help keep this episode's message top of mind in your life. Don't forget friends and family members who could use an Art Lab mental boost too. Just go to therapybites.myshopify.com. Hey, T-Ballers. Thanks so much for being with us today. If we brought value to your day, show us some love by leaving your positive feedback and inviting some friends to listen in and join the T-Ball team. Government legal gobbledygook. Not intended as a diagnostic or as an alternative to professional clinical treatment. Resources and advice are for information and entertainment purposes only. Brought to you by... Someone saying things you don't like? Tape that nagging loudmouth shut. Government approved speech tape. Gas tape. Now available at your local hardware store. Therapy Bites Heart Lab is not, not, not an approved, not, endorsed, not. authorized, blood kissing affiliate of the United States Special Offense Assessment Police. Soap Police for short. Warning! Consumption of Therapy Bites Heart Lab content by Kool Aid drinking, stinking, thinking, social media, pseudo psychological pushing, wacky woke anti free speech mumbo jumbo advocates may cause spontaneous internal skull combustion, stomach discomfort, and or laxative effects. Allergy warning. Therapy Bites is manufactured in a facility that challenges nutty distortions, processes nuggets of accurate, realistic thinking, and life affirming reliefs. This is the audio version of the legal fine print. Why are you still listening to this when you can catch the next great episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab with a good friend or family member? Really? Are you still there? <laughs> this is getting silly. Move on to the next psychologically thrilling episode of the best advice on the net. No copay required. Me eat copay. Yeah, with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball team. Go ahead. Don't be podgorophobic. Scoot, scoot, scoot. On to the next episode!